Welcome everybody to DTD301 Hands-On Predictive Analytics. Um, this is Pianka here and uh, this, is, this course is the level 3 course so it is a follow-on to Hands-On Business Analytics course which uh, I think most of you have taken already and we're going to build on the framework that we have learned on the business analytics with here with the um, some advanced, um, advanced uh, material here. So, all right. So as you know BADIS stands for um, the five steps is an acronym for five steps, uh, starting from business question, uh, then going into the analysis plan and then re collecting relevant data uh, and driving insights, which is, you know, where the biggest modeling part will happen. That's where we spend the most of our time in, in, in this course and then making recommendations. Um, and then all throughout you'll have the blue track and the green track. Now business question question section is exactly the same for both the both whether you use business analytics or predictive analytics. And it's in the analysis plan section where the split happens, where you'd make a decision of which methodology you'd go for. And that's, you know, and based on if you go for predictive anal analytics uh, methodologies, regression or and so on, you'll you'll um, you'll need some additional components in all of these sections. Uh, but majority, the major changes in the in the derived insights and model building stage. So, as I just briefly talked about, these four methodologies are uh, was what was the focus on our hands-on business analytics course, and we have discussed it in detail, uh, and it's also discussed in detail in the in the book uh, behind every good decision. Um, in this course, we're going to focus uh, on predictive analytics, which is specifically within predictive analytics, we're going to go into linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree, and then uh, segmentation. In specific in segmentation, we're going to look at k-means clustering, which is the most common methodology within that. We're back to our blue track, right? Uh, remember what our blue track is. It helps us build our insights, okay, using our data and analytics. So, uh, so what we have is three main steps for our predictive analytics framework okay uh, we have data prep uh, which is you know uh, it's it's the very first step you need to follow this because you're going to need to clean the data and prepare it to make it uh, usable for your models you then go ahead and build your actual models right you um, identify which variables are most predictive and helpful in explaining your outcome and then what do you need to do? You need to uh, actually translate your model output or your findings into something that is easily interpretable to uh, you know, your audience. Uh, why do we uh, need to worry about missing values? Okay? You'll see that most data in real life, you know, there will be some variable or some column for which you'll see you know, randomly here and there missing. You know, it'll be any question mark, blank, whatever it is in the data set that you'll you know, visually see and uh, you, you'll be able to identify the missing values. Okay? So why do we need to worry about them? Why can we not just ignore them and move on and just do our modeling? So we need to identify and remove any missing values you know, as strategically as possible because if we don't, then uh, you know the row that has any missing value for any variable will automatically get dropped in our analysis. Okay, so if there's an observation that has missing values for two variables, that observation will automatically get dropped. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing again same thing as before. If we target the top twenty percent of the test sample, ordered using the predictions, which are nothing but the probability is home priced we would capture 80% or four times as many of the high-priced homes versus if we were to target randomly 20% of the sample, okay? Which we would get by being on the 45 degree line. So you see how this lift curve is very useful in characterizing how good a model is versus when you don't use a model. And you'll see in your bank model framework how it's even more useful because it's a marketing data set, right? So it's going to be of all the more benefit to use something like lift. Okay, so now let's all finally compare our logit versus or logistic versus decision tree, right? Those are also two models that we want to kind of, they're similar, they're classification, but we don't know which one is really better, right? So for doing that, we're going to again use ROC, all right? Now, remember one thing. Um, so let's actually, let's go back and do this and then we'll go through that answer in a minute. So we're combining, so we're first for decision tree, we're building the ROC, right? First using prediction, then using test, and then we go ahead and plot it here, right? So if you're going to plot it, let's expand this. Okay, see this here. 
Okay, what is your conclusion? Logistic is better somewhat than decision tree. In Nime, decision tree is kind of simple enough. So what you do is in here, remember, we're going to use just the selected data. We'll split the data again using rule-based low splitter, um, you know, training test validation. We'll put in the training data into a column splitter. So once the training data is fit into the tree learner, okay, we're going to go ahead and execute it and we take a look at the view. Now it may look different, okay, in uh, Nine because it's not necessary you get the exact same results in R and Nine. So the way you look at it is you'll open it up and then you keep clicking on the pluses, okay, you'll see it keeps expanding. Now, now that we've, you know, done with the nuts and bolts that go behind this plot, let's look at what it actually means. So we're quantifying the impact of the final model for AIMS. So what we do is um, we are going to um, interpret this and uh, kind of tease out what are the effects of different variables on sale price. For example, exterior features, okay, where are they? Gray, they have quite a lot of, you know, some of them, it's kind of high positive effect. If we ignore this one long bar, which is, which tells us that being a new home sale has the most positive impact on the sale price, which is understandable. If we ignore that, I mean, we don't want to ignore that, but keeping that in mind, the other coefficients that are really powerful are the ones that are coming from exterior features, okay? Which would mean, for example, having a hillside contour versus any other kind of land contour almost has a 15% uh, impact on sale price. So uh, going back to the Ames Iowa uh, housing price model that we've been building uh, example, our objective uh, for our friend uh, who are moving into the town, moving into Ames Iowa was to quantify relative effect size of features driving the sale price of a house in Ames Iowa. And uh, based on the model that we have built, we recommend for them to buy a house with as many of these features as possible. So a new home on a hillside with paved drive, uh, with air conditioning and with a positive land feature like a park. And, um, and then uh, the features we would like or negative features that we would like them to avoid are poor and average, poor to average exterior quality, poor to average overall house quality. So that's more, that's, these are the biggest factors. No full bath and basin, that's a big no-no. Uh, no fireplace and poor to average uh, overall house condition.